Yeah, um, it is a cloudy morning in Chicago, and uh, uh, I'm uh, have the privilege uh, uh, to sit with uh, um, Pastor Pastor Rick Kour, and I, I met pa Pastor Rick uh, recently, in fact, on our uh, our favorite place here at the be uh, Lake Michigan Beach, and uh, I was reading, and Pastor Kour, uh, Kour was Pastor Rick was uh, running, and then also I saw him pray. And then we we started talking to each other, and I found out that he comes uh, to the shore of the lake regularly, and that he speaks to people, prays with people. I was very impressed by that because I don't know many people who do that. And um, uh, so he agreed to to sit and have a, a, a an interview about his personal journey, and that's the first question I'm going to ask him: How did you get to where you are now? Uh, the pastor of Near West uh, Vineyard Church on uh, Roosevelt Road, right? Roosevelt and what is it? Uh, Laughlin. Um, that's just a spur, but 1443 West Roosevelt. So just a uh, block east of Ashland and Roosevelt, which most people in the city who are familiar with the city would know. Yeah, yeah. And Pastor Rick has uh, studied at the uh, Illinois State University in Bloomington, Normal, and then also uh, he has a Master's in Divinity from Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. So please, uh, Pastor Rick, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so um, I was not necessarily predisposed to uh, liking religion. And now uh, religion is a term um, that uh, we have to sort of define. So if we're talking about religion as in uh, uh, human beings uh, manipulating uh, other human beings for the sake of their uh, gain, you know, exploiting them or things like that, uh, then I'm against religion, right? Karl Marx said that uh, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. And one reason I wasn't predisposed to spirituality, even though I grew up in it, it was part of my rhythm. Um, I grew up in a Lutheran church. I'm a vineyard pastor now, so uh, they're very uh, a little different when it comes to what that looks like on a Sunday, uh, was my mom had an affair with a pastor. And uh, that made me... Uh, in one sense, hate pastors. And so I remember sitting in the pews. Uh, I remember sitting in the pew and uh, and I was eight years old at the time. So this, a lot of this, is, you know, I've thought about afterwards, but uh, I just remember, you know, like, I, I could preach better than that. Um, and then when the, when the whole thing broke out, when it comes to the affair, uh, I look back at that as um, being a person that would probably be predisposed to hating pastors. And, and there's probably some of that in me uh, where <clears throat> Um, I saw this person, and this actually, this pastor actually had an affair with uh, uh, someone else previously at the previous church. They were moved to the church that we were at, and uh, we had to suffer uh, from uh, his um, oppression and uh, his misuse of power. Um, what that did for me was spark a desire um, for um, being genuine and being real. And when I grew up and when I was in the this uh, church, a lot of my peers were uh, individuals who really weren't interested in it. They were there because there was a school attached to the church, and uh, there wasn't a real genuine spiritual interest. And so uh, I didn't have people that were my age uh, that were uh, really interested in spirituality from what I saw. Now, fast forward to college. I went to college, and um, I still would go to church. I wanted to go to church. If I didn't go to church on a Sunday, I sort of felt empty, like something was missing. Um, I, I liked the aspect of uh, philosophically talking about something greater than just my life, a uh, greater purpose, uh, if you want to, want to call it destiny. Um, that that was interesting to me. Now, my mom also let me have keggers uh, at my house. So my senior year, I was uh, the the bash was a phrase that, uh, was uh, well known um, in our high school because uh, my mom would let us have parties, and so people would come to our house and we'd uh, we'd party. And um, through that, I saw how uh, you know if if I was hosting the party, uh, people were very friendly with me. Um, if they wanted to get in, they'd be very friendly with me. If I let them in, they'd be friendly with me. Um, but also, uh, it was very utilitarian in the sense that if uh, people didn't get uh, access to the party. Um, or if the party didn't exist, um, a lot of the, the the relationship was bent on that. So I uh, went to Southern Illinois University in the 80s. It was the, uh, I'm, I'm a little younger than the 80s, but uh, it was um, uh, one of the top 25 party schools, according to Playboy. And uh, and so 
I don't know why I went there, partly because I could get in, partly because it was as far away from a home as I could get. And when I left, I realized, I realized I actually love my family more than I thought. And uh, I was dating someone at the time, and uh, I got out a week earlier than her. She went to Illinois State, so um, I decided to go there, transfer there. All my friends drugged out, flunked out, or transferred. And um, and when I went there, um, I go there for a month, and we break up, right? Well, the last week of the semester of uh, the, my freshman year, my first year, um, again, I got out a week earlier than she did. And so I visited her and she was involved in a uh, organization called Young Life. And through that, I met uh, an individual uh, named Ben Davidson who introduced me to a group called Crew. And uh, Crew was a, um, a group that uh, focused on campus ministry. And so he always would invite me. Uh, I would always say no, I'd have some lame excuse. And uh, in the last, um, yeah, last a meeting of the semester, I decided to go. And um, in going, um, I meeting and um, when I went to this meeting, I. Um, yeah, I met this guy, um, and his name was Ben Davidson. He invited me um, to this group, and at the end of this meeting uh, with Crew, my uh, so it was my third semester, first semester at Illinois State University. Uh, he was inviting people to meet, and as he was inviting people to meet, uh, he was doing this for, for sort of like an end of the year uh, type of experience. And for me, like I just came for my first time, and I was like, "Well, hey, can we get the other two? As as I saw him inviting everyone else, but uh, his intent was to only invite. Uh, at least how I understood it later, uh, just the individuals that had been involved. And so when I did this, um, I met with him and uh, my brother was in the army, he came back uh, and we had a party and we we're playing uh, baseball, which is a drinking game. And I was just telling him about the game and what I did. And and for me, like drinking wasn't wrong. I, like I, even in the church, I saw people drinking and, um, you know, they, they didn't have a stigma with that or anything like that as uh, you know, some, um, uh, religious or spiritual people do. And so I was just sort of surprised that he was surprised about me telling this. And then he, um, uh, so anyways, we went to share and he actually just challenged me. He's just like, you know, Hey, I challenge you just not to drink, you know? And, uh, and so I didn't have, uh, an illegal drink. I did have a drink in Mexico because you could be 18 there, but I didn't have a legal drink after that. And it was, it was interesting because, um, I would have thought it completely absurd for someone to ask me to not drink and me actually do it. Uh, but at that time, after uh, I had my experience in high school and I uh, was able to do what I was able to do, I found it not satisfying. And when I went to college, I, uh, like I said, I wanted to go to uh, church just because I, I felt like thinking about greater things than just myself was something positive to do. And uh, and so after that happened, um, he actually ended up taking me out to the story of Jesus with people. And I was actually sharing the story of Jesus when I myself was not uh, committed to Jesus and uh, in the, that springtime of my uh, fourth semester, um, I gave my life to Jesus, and um, and and it really made a difference to see people my age who were excited about it. But not only that, that were actually like doing um, what Jesus did, uh, living out a life that that uh, Jesus lived out. And um, yeah, and there's a lot of um, you know, especially here in Chicago. I've lived in Chicago for 20 years, where it's just like you know, uh, people make the statement that uh, you know all. Uh, I've, I've heard the statements, you know, all politicians are, um, are evil or, um, you know, you have to be arrogant to be a pastor. And it's just like, well, th these, these statements of um, uh, completion aren't, they're just not true, you know, and, and there are pastors and priests and moms and uh, rabbis and individuals who do want um, uh, to do something beyond themselves and then there are the same groups of people and pastors and moms and rabbis and priests who uh who are going to abuse the system and um and so after i gave my life to jesus um i wanted to not just look at scripture read scripture and um and just say hey that's nice i wanted to try it and um <clears throat> so in 2015 i started uh doing that I, specifically when it comes to healing and i started praying for people on the streets of chicago and I prayed for a guy. I asked him on a scale of zero to 10 what his pain was at. His pain was at a three. I prayed in the authority of Jesus. His pain was gone. And I was surprised. Um, and this has happened hundreds of times since. 
and um, and it's made me to uh, you know we can uh, be intellectual about scripture. We can explain things away. We can say, oh, you know, uh, the rich man, young ruler was told to give everything. Uh, I, I I had a person call me three years ago, and she and she's like, you know, a friend uh, has given everything, and they're moving to Ukraine. Uh, so there's there's still people that actually do that. There's still people that say, okay, wow, this person gave away everything. I'm going to do that. Um, there's people that uh, live uh, homeless, um, and they do it voluntarily. Um, now we might not see that because we're not in those circles, but uh, but but I've seen people that have done that. Um, so anyways, after going back to college, after that, I uh, committed my, my life, um, a one year of just full service to, to the Lord. And uh, that looked like um, being on campus in Valencia, Spain. Uh, and that decision to go there affected the trajectory of my life. I speak Spanish. I, I in a Spanish speaking neighborhood, primarily a Latino neighborhood right now. I live in Brighton Park uh, near 35th in California. Um, and that that one decision to be a missionary uh, gave me the opportunity to speak Spanish. That opportunity to speak Spanish uh, affected uh, my work placements. My work place placements have affected where I live and where I raise my children today. Um, and it's funny because when we look at our lives, we can see uh, a couple different things. Um, my my decision to, because my, my first choice was Germany. My second choice was, I think, Ireland. Uh, my third choice was Spain. I got my third choice. Um, uh, I was asked when I was uh, working in finance, I worked for a bank, um, worked for Bank of America, and I was asked by my boss, Rick, do you speak Spanish or not? And I was like, uh, sort of. And uh, me saying yes to speaking Spanish, she sort of pressed me. She's like, okay, I get Rick, I got to put something down. I was like, yeah, I do. Uh, and that put me in the placement where I uh, was actually the um, uh, the personal banker that spoke Spanish. And, and I actually worked with a Venezuelan lady uh, who couldn't speak Spanish. And so every time we got together with clients, everyone would talk to her. Uh, and then I'd have to respond because they thought that she spoke Spanish and I didn't, but it was actually the reverse. I spoke Spanish and she did not. Um, and, uh, and and so I've been in Chicago for 20 years. My wife and I uh, have been uh, encouraging people at the near West Vineyard for 17 years. Um, yeah, yeah. You, Pastor Rick, yeah, uh, before you continue this, uh, the, the story, uh, how was your experience in Spain? Uh, you said you went to Spain for a yeah. year. So yeah. Spain, um, I got invited to an anti-American communist rally. I decided since I didn't want an FBI uh, rap sheet that I said no to that. But uh, and also, you know, there may, maybe my safety, if people found out where I was from, might have been an issue as well. Um, uh, the, the individuals there that my age at the time, um, I mean, they were under, uh, you know, they're just coming out of Franco, the dictatorship and having their parents gone through that. Um, and that was very heavy handed for a lot of the people that live there. Um and um, yeah, there was just no, I mean, the climate, the culture, the people were wonderful. Uh, the spiritual deadness was poignant. Um, and, uh, and you know, anytime you said words like faith or uh, soul or uh, unconditional love or things like this, um, are you in a cult? Are you in a sect? Uh, that, that was like the first response because um, hmm. they were taught to, uh, look at spirituality that way as as anything that was outside their tradition as something that was uh, uh, wrong, evil, or uh, anathema, you know, uh, uh, something to stay away from. And it really um, precluded any conversation spiritually. Uh, and so we were looking to just normalize spiritual conversations to get people thinking about it. Um, and I look at the churches in Mexico versus Spain and and just what has happened when it comes to the church and um, and, you know, you have people uh, like, uh, you know, in South America, like Pedro Claver, and you have uh, Hidalgo, and you have different individuals and priests in Spain, um, I'm sorry, in, in, in Mexico, who really, really fought for the people, who really, really were helping the people who were there. Pedro Claver was an individual, if you don't know him, uh, who was basically a doctor, a medic. He basically took slaves off the boats and ministered to them. Uh, people who were lost, broken, and no one cared about. In fact, they were looked at as chattel. They were looked at as as less than human. Uh, and there are, there are priests and there are people that stepped up to love them. Whereas in Spain, you had the Inquisition and you had uh, a lot of the corruption that, that was visibly seen uh, and a lot of distrust as a part of that. And so these are all things like looking at history, looking at my life, looking at uh, my experience with uh, my mom and uh, the pastor that uh, uh, took advantage of her. Uh, I wanted to be genuine. I, I wanted to be true. I look at David's life and, uh, you know, once David had an affair with Bathsheba, 
his his ministry goes down. And uh, part of part of it for me is just like, oh, let me be faithful. Let me be faithful to the people. Let me tr be true to what God wants me to do. Um, and, uh, and and when people interact with me on the streets, I often get man, I, I prayed today for a sign and you are that sign or, um, uh, wow, I mean, I've, I've never had anyone ask me for prayer. Um, and I, and I get these really, really strange responses because people are used to being exploited. They're, they're used to this existential utilitarianism where, you know, you're only as good as what you can do for me. Uh, I can treat you like a, uh, a pawn because you're a cashier at a store, uh, because you know what, if you're not doing your job for me, then, um, then you, you might as well not be human. Um, and, uh, and we, we, you know, people don't say these things because uh, I think if we verbalize these things, we would uh, realize what we're saying. But but it's the attitude that's displayed and how we uh, don't care for the people around. And um, and so, um, you know, part of my week this week was uh, helping out a, a Venezuelan lady uh, get connected with, with a job. And, um, and so I spent uh, five hours of my day uh, driving to New Lenox uh, to a place where she might have a, a job just because I wanted to make sure she was safe um, and, uh, and hopefully giving her an opportunity that she never would have had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's, uh, when I hear you speak about these encounters and uh, what you do, I think three days of the week or four days you go, I think, on the campus of UIC. Right. Yeah. yeah, two days a week. So uh, my spiritual discipline is 10 hours of walking the streets of Chicago. So I um, I do, um, you know, I start at the shelter at 2241 um, South Halstead. So I'm interacting with uh, mostly Venezuelan individuals there. Uh, a lot of the conversations, actually, the majority of them are in Spanish. Uh, they'll walk down 19th or 18th Street through Pilsen. Uh, so to artists and um uh, and obviously the individuals, the Mexican individuals who've been there for a while, uh, those conversations could be in whatever Spanish or English. Then I go up through the Brooks homes. And so uh, last I checked when it comes to murders and stabbings, and I, 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 I witnessed a drive through there. So I had uh, bullets going off the uh, street pole above my head when I was there once. And, um, and about 10 out of 12 months, you're looking at murders or shootings uh, in the, in, a, in about a half mile radius of downtown. Uh, and that's, uh, the most shootings and the most murders. Uh, so we're talking about troop hastings. So uh, more roughly like Loomis, uh, Roosevelt, just southeast of there. Uh, then I'll go up to um, if if it's not nice um, weatherwise or uh, later in the the the, the season. I'll go to the medical district. Um, so talking to doctors and patients and nurses and medical staff, uh, people visiting, people that are in the hospital. Uh, then I'll go to campus. So um, so up Loomis. Then I go over to maybe Wood. Um, Ashland, uh, Taylor there, Street area, go through Little Italy, then go to campus, talking to professors and students. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's about a 5.4 mile walk, um, if I'm not, you know, uh, deviating from that. So it's, you know, uh, I'm in, uh, and I am, so it's, you know, sometimes a 10, 10, 10 miles I'm walking a day. I think I've walked up to 17 miles in a day. Uh, I've gotten 49,000 steps in one day before. Um, mm, wow. So uh, I walk 5.2 million steps a day but anyways i'm doing this as i interact with people and that that area of the city of chicago is is just uh, so diverse uh lori lightfoot when she was uh, mayor she said you know ashland and roosevelt is is sort of the uh you know south of uh um roosevelt west of ashland are where more of the uh the black and brown neighborhoods are and so we're right on that sort of um uh, fault line, if you want to call it that, I don't know what you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, where there's just a lot of diversity and a lot of uh, interactions between different uh, people groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I hear you speak is it, you do something very, I don't hear many people do that, actually. I haven't heard anyone because we're we're more or less isolated, right? You, you, you don't go out and, and speak more or less randomly to the people you you see and and uh, what i mean to say is a lot of people fall to the fault lines right uh, because uh, no amount of policy or programs or social programs charities can let's say capture or or uh, everyone right and and there are many people and i'm saying that almost like a question uh, people who fall fall to the fault lines and the, the no one knows of their pain of or of their concerns, right? Three weeks, I probably had ten people just start crying on the spot. 
And, um, you know, we have this opportunity for us to, you know, I, I, uh, this might be blasphemous to some of you, but for me, it's just like Jesus Christ is a great garbage man. What do I mean by that? Well, you know what? He takes our sin. He takes our anger. He takes our jealousy. Um, and and for him, for us, it's awful. It's something that just destroys us. For him, it's a willing offering. We can give this as an offering to him. Uh, in that process, we're cleansing ourselves. And so for us, when it comes to physiologically, if we don't go to the bathroom in a couple of days, we're, we're going to be dead. I mean, our, uh, you know, Poland's stock, something's happening. But we don't think of that when it comes to the spiritual garbage we have and the uh, mental garbage we have. And what happens is is, is with how our society is set up, uh, at least when it comes to the interactions that I've had, and I've probably had between, if, depending on how you define a conversation, 20,000 to 50,000 conversations in the last 17 years. Uh, what I've noticed is that people in Chicago don't do well with how to manage their mental health. Uh, because like I said, we'll take out our garbage because it will stink, you know, but when our, our mental activity stinks, uh, you know, we often have our little um, closets that we can go into. So no one else smells our junk, um, but it's still there. I mean, just because uh, someone else doesn't smell it, it doesn't mean it's not there. We, and, and, and we want to convince ourselves and we want to put our best uh, uh, TikTok video up or Insta video up or a Facebook video up if you're older. Um and uh, and and we want to we we have this culture where we want to put our best foot forward, and uh, and that's be very detrimental to our souls and our mental health. And then and then who's gonna who's gonna teach us? Who's gonna teach us how to uh, deal with our mental garbage? Who's gonna t teach us? And uh, and even with the, with the church, I mean, lament is um, is is such an important thing. And I, I I encourage people in my church to be expert complainers. What do I mean by that? Complain to God first. You know. Because I don't need your projectile vomit, and your neighbor doesn't need your projectile vomit. And when you when you com start complaining to people, and if you don't have an outlet spiritually or mentally to interact with people, you're puking on people, and you're making a greater mess. But when we learn to bring our things before God, and if we if everyone complained to God before they complained to a person, this world would be such a better place. But what happens is we drag other people into our vomit uh, cesspool, and we drown them in it. And um, and so uh, the, the simple. Um, acronym that I have, my, my, my wife likes cats, my, my kids like cats, but it's T-cat. Turn to God, complain to God, address the new reality, and trust God with that reality. And that, that is a process of lament that is, uh, I think, whether you believe in God or not, is crucial to your mental health, to be able to, to because what it does is it allows you to think through what you're going through. It allows you to mentally process it. It allows you to discharge uh, this, and it allows you to look to what freedom is. A lot of times, we, if we get stuck in complaint, and we're just complaining, 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 that's not good. You know, when it comes to our relationship with God, um, you know, there, obviously that our relationship with God is different with our relationship with humans. But but in this, I think it's similar. You know, have you ever been around that person that just talks? all the time and you can't have a conversation with them well if you don't you're probably that person and in any conversation you need to have someone talking and someone listening and so why would i why would i be that person who why would i be that person to god who is always talking and never listening and uh and i when I, I saw Adrian, I think it was yesterday, and I told him, you know, I have a time of silence as well, right? Because, what you know, if if you're in a conversation and you're with someone and someone's always talking, that's lunacy too, right? So what I do is I, I um, when I'm at the beach, I have a time where I just walk the length of the beach. And this Oakwood Beach is where I go, so it's a pretty uh, short beach. And, um, and I just say, you know what, God, I'm not going to say anything. If you want to speak to me then you can speak to me. And if you don't, that's fine with me too. I'll, I'll also enjoy your presence. And, uh, and then sometimes I get stuff downloaded to me for either a sermon, some poetry, uh, artistic stuff. Sometimes I get, hey, you need to talk to this person, ask this person this question. Um, and, and it's a conversation. And, um, and, and this is where religion, or I, I prefer the word spirituality because I think religion has such a negative connotation. This is where my walk with Jesus um, is, is really vibrant. When, when I believe I'm receiving something from God that is practically helping uh, someone next to me, someone around me, I'm hearing from God. It's not just some person, people like, well, how can you trust a Bible that was written 2,000 years ago? Or how can you uh, trust something that's written maybe even 3,000 years ago? Well, you know what? It just wasn't written 2,000, 3,000 years ago. 
uh, the, the Lagos. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. And the word was God. The Lagos, uh, it incorporates the scripture, but but the Lagos, the, the verb uh, in Spanish is how it's translated, or the word of God, uh, the presence of Jesus Christ is so much greater because he speaks today. And if, if he doesn't speak today, then religion is worthless. If he doesn't speak today, then we might as well go ahead and follow something else. But the Lord speaks today. And he guides our actions if we're open to it. Now, if you don't have that worldview or, oh, God can't speak, well, psh, you're probably not going to hear. But if you say, hey, God, speak to me. Speak to me. Maybe he'll just speak to you. I love your TCAT uh, example. But as you were explaining it, what crossed my mind was, what if someone on the one hand, maybe doesn't believe, right? Should they just pretend? Or or they're, you know, and you say they, they don't do that second part where they, you know, get rid of the garbage. And, and I agree with you, that's very hard to do. And we take it for granted, right? We, uh, I use, I explain in my class how uh, we get junked up, right? We accumulate so much junk and uh, un unaware and un, you know we're unaware and then we wonder why we're mentally and spiritually clogged up and it's fascinating to see how various religions have disciplines right where disciplines are meant to really put you back in in order like uh, spiritual plumbing if you want and but there are people who just uh, you know, uh, uh, it's hard for them to bring themselves to to that state of mind where they might say, well, maybe I need, let's say, outside help, or maybe I cannot do it on my own, right? Because we live in a culture that constantly bombards us with the message that, well, it's on you. Uh, you're the center. You, you can do it. Uh, you got it all within you. Mistrust. Anything that comes from outside, be it, you know, the state, be it the city, be it the neighborhood, be it God, right? Be it other people, right? There is a deep suspicion of others. That's why what you do is fascinating because it's, it's you know, it's interesting how you actually manage to talk to people given that there there is a probably a rejection there, right? Anyway, so please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, you know, when it comes to specifically the Brooks homes, when I first went there, the uh, a lot of the residents thought I was a police officer, and a lot of the police officers thought I was a drug dealer, a guy who wanted drugs. Uh, and so there is this aspect of trust. But, uh, you know, like this interview is a result of me meeting you, doing my regular rhythms. Um, I've uh, uh, had speaking engagements on UIC campus, probably, you know, from these conversations, I've gone to baptisms, I've gone to... Uh, 21st birthday parties, all from uh, people that I had met on, on the streets. And um, and I could go on with the list of that. And it's it's like, you know, a lady talked to me. She wasn't uh, she wasn't a follower of Jesus. She wasn't a Christian. Uh, she did. She wasn't um, of really any religious background. And she's like, you know what? The first time I thought you, I thought you were a creep. The second time I thought you, I was like, oh, he's just a guy in the neighborhood, but he, she didn't have time. And the third time she saw me, she's she she received prayer and it was a positive experience, you know, Um and uh, and and if we can't trust anyone, um, we're going to live a lonely, miserable life. And um, you're, you know, I believe that we are created in relationship. I believe uh, there's a Trinity. I believe there's a Father, uh, God. There's a, a God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And uh, and and the the essence of God is that of relationship. And if the essence of God is relationship, and um, we're supposed to be holy as God is holy, right? Be holy as He is holy. We're supposed to imitate God in things that we're able to. Can we do that a hundred percent? No, because because God's God, right? But um, but in this area, in relationship we are. And so for those who've never experienced uh, God or don't have this background, um, I think the, the question is just like, okay, God, if you're real, show me. I mean, is, it, is that going to hurt? Is that going to hurt you to ask that question? I mean, it's a, uh, and be open to it. God, give me a sign in the next 24 hours. Can give me something um, that, that shows that you know something about me. I was walking on 18th Street and um, right by Morgan, between Morgan and, and Halstead on the on north side of the street. And I saw a lady walking and um, I didn't want to startle her because I was coming up beh behind her. So I just sort of, you know, took a, about 10 steps to her left so she didn't think I was right uh, behind her and 
just turned to her. I was just like, uh, do you want some prayer? And, and her response is, yes, I'm a heroin addict. And, um, and she's one of those ladies. And so we, I prayed for her and I still actually contact her. This is about seven, eight years ago. And she's, uh, she uh, was contemplating um, killing herself and things like that, contemplating on what, what her life would be like. And, um, and, she, and she's one of those individuals. She prayed uh, for, for God to show her and, uh, and, and I appeared. Right. And, um, and, uh, and so having an openness, having this ability, like we we're, we're in university and we, we think we know everything and, uh, or maybe we wouldn't say that, but there's areas where we think we're experts and, uh, and God's willing to open us up, uh, to different things. And, and I believe all people, no matter what background we have, have the ability to, to recognize three things. And one is that, uh, there is a God, um, you know, I have a, a proof of love, proof of systems, proof of uh, matter. I could go into those another time uh, if anyone's interested in talking more. But uh, I believe there are there are proofs uh, for uh, at least an intelligent designer, and um, and so one that we can believe that um, there is a God. Two, uh, we can understand that we're not God. I mean, I didn't create this. I didn't create myself. And three, in one way or another, we can uh, acknowledge or honor God. Um, you know, I've heard uh, different missionaries who are in Muslim cultures who follow Jesus, um, but because of the five prayers, because of the culture, uh, they're not necessarily w w w willing to experience depression there. And so when they go to prayers, they pray uh, to God the Father uh, with an understanding that Jesus Christ has died for their sins. Uh, but because of the culture that they're in, they're not willing to make the sacrifice of just coming out. And, and they've described themselves as... Um, Muslims in the way of Jesus Christ, and uh, so again, that's not Orthodox Islam. I understand that, uh, but it, but it's but but what 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 is it? You know, uh, Moses, David, uh, they didn't have Jesus there. So are, are Moses and, and David and hell? Well, even most uh, far right conservative Christians wouldn't say that. They wouldn't say Moses or David are in hell. Well, 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 how did they get there? Well, we look at Hebrews twelve, and it was in the hope of the Messiah. So Moses had the hope of a Messiah. David had the hope of of, of Messiah. What does the Messiah mean? Messiah just means anointed one in Hebrew. Christ is the, the Greek version of anointed one. So someone anointed who was anointed, the priests and the kings and the prophets, those who were, were leading, right? Um, uh, so Isaiah 61, I believe it is quoted in Luke 4, says that I have been anointed to preach good news to the poor. That That's, that's the beginning of Jesus' ministry, to preach good news to the poor. Why the poor? Man, I've seen some great faith among some very, very poor people. Um, today at about four o'clock, a lady I met with earlier this week is going to move from a shelter on the north side of Chicago to live in a house uh, that some guy on the street just asked her to do it and, and, and be her maid. And it's just like, and I'm just like, you know what? I don't know this guy. I don't know if this guy's legit. I don't know if he's going to try to sex traffic you or labor traffic you. I don't know any of this. Uh, I'm trusting this guy is who he says he is and he's trying to do the best. And, uh, and she's like, you know, God's in control. And, uh, and and prayerfully, it's a great experience for her. Uh, but just being open uh, again, we have this jadedness, jadedness, and this cynicism uh, that we have to cut through. Uh, because, um, you know, I think it's funny when it comes to universities and uh, you know, obviously if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably taking a comparative uh, religion class, but, but what is the purpose of life? You know, how many, how many philosophy classes actually tackle that? Um, I, um, and, and, you know, and I'd be curious because, because I think that sometimes we are discouraged because it's a trite answer. What's the answer of life? 42, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. What, whatever you might think when it comes to uh, different meanings for life, but like, really, what is the meaning of your life? What is the meaning of your life? Are you able to ask that? Is that too daunting of a question for you to ask? Because if you ask it when you're 70, and you forgot to ask it when you're 15 or you're 20 or you're 25 or you're 30, you're putting yourself on a pretty badass trajectory. So where do you go? Ask that question when you're young. What's the purpose? Does God exist? Like I'll, I'll ask people, I was like, God, oh, do you want prayer? No. Well, what's my next question? Have you heard the story of Jesus from a Christian perspective? Because I know, you know, Muslims, uh, you know, believe in, in Christ. Actually, both Muslims and Christians believe that Jesus is going to return, which is pretty crazy. Both Muslims and Christians believe that Mary uh, had uh, Jesus uh, from a virgin birth, which is pretty crazy as well. But like, what, what is your purpose? 
Ask that question. And if you're one of those persons where you're going to say, you know, would you like some prayer? No, I'm not religious. Well, why aren't you religious? Oh, I'm an atheist. Why are you an atheist? That's a lot. There's a lot of faith to be an atheist. Or, and I, I encourage anyone, if you've never read anything, read the book of Mark. It's the shortest story of Jesus's life. It's the shortest story of Jesus's life. And, uh, and that's just ways for us to, to start out. Those are some starting points. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I mean, we, uh, and what I notice in my teaching, because I ask students to uh, introduce themselves, and especially in the religion classes, what is their view of religion? Do they practice any religion? And a refrain that is coming back is this, well, I was raised this and that, Catholic or evangelical, but I'm not anymore. And I'm asking myself, okay, why is that happening, right? Why, uh, why maybe it's the rebel moment, right? The prodigal, spiritual prodigal son moment where you reject or rebel against what you're given, which I guess is normal to a certain degree. And then you go out and then maybe you come back later. Because that's another thing I just noticed that my uh, evening classes, which in which the students are uh, more adult, like right in their 40s, there seems to be a, 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 another the ref, the refrain there the, the is as well we're looking or I found this or that so there there is a sense in which some come back right nevertheless uh, there is a way in which I believe we the church broadly understood right Catholic evangelical Orthodox I'm not sure we're serving this the young right on the one hand on the other hand. I don't think they are aware that there is a lot of anti-spirituality, anti-religion, quote-unquote, propaganda in a place like Chicago, right? Yeah, so can you can you offer some thoughts along those lines? Uh, I put a few things on. Thank you. So, so a couple things. You know, we in our culture, uh, maybe we could describe it as Greek, maybe we could describe it as Roman, but when it comes to tutelage or Plato or Socrates or things like that, um, there's this aspect in, in the Greek culture and a lot of Western cultures where we teach by education. And this is a lot of times mental. What someone described to me as the, um, you know, sort of the, the Jewish take on this or maybe uh, more of a, uh, it might be Middle Eastern, it might be uh, more of an uh, Eastern way of looking at it. I'm not sure. I don't know as much about that, but this idea of like, okay, having like a rabbi, having someone who teaches you. Right. And so, um, you know, how many of you, even if you're Christian, have had someone say, you know what, dad, mom, front of the family, mentor, spiritual mentor, let's go on the streets. You know, Matthew, um, I believe it's 10, sends out, Jesus sends out the disciples. Why is he, what does he send the disciples to do? Heal the sick, cast out demons, right? And preach the good news. Well, maybe we're preaching the good news in a lot of churches, but uh, has your pastor taught you how to cast out demons? Do demons exist? Or is that just a figment of our imagination because that's the way that the old world used to describe what mental illness was? Um, I think there's demons. Um, and so do has, has your mentor or pastor taken you out to go heal heal people, right? Um, that's in the Bible. You know, what does disciple mean? A disciple, it means teacher or learner. Are we if we're if we're students of Christ, then we do what Christ did, right? And so um I would say that if if you don't see it. If no one's there to teach you, how are you going to learn it? You know, Moses had Joshua, right? Uh, Jesus had uh, his disciples, his teachers. The disciples had their individuals. Paul had Timothy, right? So if you're serious about your learning, then get a mentor. Get a mentor. I'm willing to mentor people. Right now, I'm looking for three or four people who look to uh, plant churches in Chicago. I'd be happy to take you on the streets. If you're a Muslim, if you're an atheist, I'd, I'm, I'd be happy to take you on the streets. You can walk with me. I can't guarantee your safety, but you'll be safer with me, especially with the gang members I know in certain neighborhoods. But go out and do it. And so I, I think that the, the gap is that we don't have mentors. I never had it for... And I'm a vineyard pastor. So vineyard pastors, we believe in healing. We believe God moves. Uh, we're not Pentecostal, but um, but we do believe in those things. And so mm -hmm. um, all that to say is that modeling is so important. Who's teaching you how to share the story of Jesus? Who's teaching you how to heal sick? Uh, and, and and it's not me healing someone. I'm not healing someone. It's the power of God that, that works through me. But I still have to open my mouth. 
be healed. Mm -hmm. Asking a person on the scale of zero to 10, where's your pain at? I've seen people who said they've had pain at 10. I've seen people who said they pain at 11. Pray in the authority of Jesus. Instantaneously, their pain is gone. So is this placebo effect? Are they lying to me? Or is the living God actually touching them? Mm -hmm. That's a question I have to deal with myself. Like, okay, are, is this person lying? Is this person lying? I can't imagine that all of them are lying. I can't imagine that all of them are having a placebo effect. That's just not logical when it comes to what I've seen. Mm -hmm. But I do have a worldview which God has put me in a specific place to talk to specific people. And that's my prayer. God, the people that are on my path, I trust that they're the people I should talk to. Mm -hmm. And I see time and time again that they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and, and the, the point uh, you make that the uh, yeah, Western culture were very much overthinking, right? It's a super, super rationalistic culture. And you see that in our education, right? We at this point we don't educate for character anymore either right we we just talk about skills what are skills right is that skill are skills enough to live a good life to live a meaningful life as you said but there is this trap that we have in western you know the western education this the, the thinking trap right and and uh, we, and we don't look at other aspects of the human being right the doing aspects now well uh, what what is the, the so your pastor? You just mentioned of the Vineyard Church. What is the Vineyard Church? Is it is it part of the evangelical family? Uh, what how is it different from other evangelical churches? And yeah, so so and, and also why are you a Vineyard? Uh, why are you in the Vineyard community and not Lutheran anymore? Yeah, so um, a lot of questions there. Um, mm -hmm. So part of it is that um, I started going to an Assembly of God church, which is a Pentecostal church. Um, now, when it comes to the idea of everyone having to speak in tongues to demonstrate the uh, Holy Spirit, which is what a lot of Pentecostals would believe, I can't subscribe to that. I believe that um, that there are some people who have the Holy Spirit that don't speak in tongues. And so that's why I'm not Pentecostal. Um, now, why am I not Lutheran? Well, um, well, part of it goes to probably my peer group i just didn't see i did see people that were following jesus as lutherans i look back at it and i, I admired uh faith of individuals there um but um the 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 probably the truest way i can say this is just that um when i was in college uh the people that, that were really living out their faith weren't lutheran and uh or at least what i what i looked at or understood as really living out their faith uh, weren't Lutheran. And so I, gra I gravitated to people who were. And, um, you know, when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to even just how we choose our friends, like we want, I mean, uh, maybe you don't, I want to be around friends who are vibrant, who are genuine, uh, who have character, um, who want to go after something. Um, I, I, there, there's something to the fact that uh, sometimes the more education we get, the stupider we become. Um, I can I can be educated how to rape someone, you know, it's like, is that the education I want? People talk about, you know, education is this uh, end all be all for, for solutions. Teach me how to carjack someone. Am I gonna, is that gonna, is that gonna make the world a better place? No. So what type of education are you actually getting? If your education isn't as uh, Adrian was talking about addressing our character, uh, the change of our heart. You know, we can do behavior modification. Religion isn't behavior modification. A relationship is transformation. And that's a big thing. And so you can read all the books you want, but if you can't have a conversation with a person in front of you, I mean, oh, man. And, um, you know, when it comes to what's happened in the last couple of years, when it comes to George Floyd, when it comes to race relations, uh, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, COVID, things like that, like, it was interesting. So many people would go ahead and talk to people. And uh, there was a big push in many churches to be like more racially diverse. I've been talking to people from African descent, European descent, um, uh, South American descent, uh, Asian descent for years. And, and it was interesting. So, you know, and people wanted to sort of, um, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm always willing to learn. I want to learn. Uh, but it was interesting where people were just like, well, have you talked to an African-American pastor? I've been like, yeah, I've been doing it for 20 years or I've been doing it for 15 years. It's just like, um, no, I mean, this is this is what I've been doing. Um, and so it's interesting because a lot of people have these new thoughts and new books will come out. Um, I don't, don't see people on the streets. I don't see people going to where people are broken. I don't uh, I don't see people interacting. I mean, I, I do. I mean, I, I do. But, but, but a lot, I'm talking about specifically uh, the intellectual elite 
those individuals where sometimes I'll get people who have all the book knowledge and they're an armchair warrior and they're not actually going out and being among people. And so, so no matter what your bent is, when it comes to, you know, for me, it's just like, who's not about justice, right? Who's not about justice? You know, I, one of my fa family members, a, a niece or nephew was just like, yeah, I want to do something with social justice. What is social justice? What is social justice? And, and this person couldn't, couldn't answer the question. You know, so for me, it's just like, I don't use the term social justice anymore because I, I just want justice. You know, it could be social, it could be educational. I just want justice, right? And part of justice is being there, putting yourself on the line. You know, I've had my ass grabbed on the streets of Chicago. I've been punched in the face besides the, the bullets that went across my head, like I, uh, around my head, like I said, you know, it's just like, um, people say, oh, pastors don't risk their lives in the United States. Well, you're talking to the wrong person. Sorry, I, I don't know that experience because uh, a lot of the pastors that I experience do risk their lives. Uh, they're trying to minister to the broken. They're trying to minister to the gang members while ministering to the people broken by the gangs. Uh, they're trying to uh, minister to the people who are going through cancer, who are disappointed with life, who want to kill themselves. I mean, this is where, uh, this is the spirituality that the, the book of James talks about, who take care of the widows uh, and the orphans. Um, and, and so we have this tension of this idea of like the social gospel, where it's just all about making people's lives better. Well, I believe when we follow what Jesus wants us to do, our lives are better now because we have an attitude of thankfulness and gratefulness, but our attitude and, and, and anything that comes with that, when it comes to uh, a possible material blessing, I'm not a health and wealth type guy that I don't, I don't believe in that, but we're also putting ourselves in a position to have eternity and to be able to experience eternity. And then you have the other side where it's just like, oh, it's just about all about the pie in the sky. And then people are, you know, they're in their little cloister and their little closets and they've uh, read the Bible seven times in one day. And, uh, but then they can't go out and show it to anyone. And so we need to have the ability for us to be both pertinent to the everyday person, whether or not, you know, for, if you're a follower of Jesus, are you willing to love a person, even if you know they're never going to accept Jesus Christ? Let's love people because they're creating the image of God. Let's get back to loving people, regardless of what we're going to get back. Um, you know, uh, organizations need money, right? So it's just like people always talk about, uh, you know, oh, pastors just want money. Well, I'd like money to turn on the lights. We spend over $10,000 feeding people who are homeless or underserved, under-resourced. And some of the food goes to the people who uh, make a lot of money, right? But food is something that all of us need. So we spend money. And we give 10% of everything we receive and we need to pay rent and things like that. And so there is that aspect of, uh, of, of even taking care and, and paying back and paying forward when it comes to what you've done, but also doing these things so we can make a difference. So people can be fed. So people can have a place to go to. Um, like I said, I worked in finance for 10 years, right? And I could help people about different things. I, I, I prayed for people's healing. Uh, I gave words of knowledge. I think I saw a person healed in my, uh, my office. Um, I had a, guy tell me he was molested by a a, a preach uh a, a, excuse me a priest i had a lady say that man uh, i should never come to chicago she was weeping and closing her bank account uh, and so i was able to minister but but now i'm able to minister in a different capacity where i'm not restricted i don't have to worry about getting fired for what i say and i'm i'm able to discuss what's most important to that person at the time and part of that's also being a janitor helping them take out the trash facilitating healing and pointing them to the one who can really clean their soul, their mind, and their heart. Amen to that. Before we uh, we end, uh, and I do that with uh, in all my interviews, uh, I'd like you to to ask to say a few things, like a message or a message advice for for young people. Yeah, um, God's given us desires of our heart, right? And so we have um, we have the option to follow those, and um, the faster you learn the just the positive aspects of what um, what those desires are, I mean, desires that are just wholesome, good, true, uh, versus the desires that would be destructive. Uh, I think the better off we're going to be, and um, and and I believe that the Holy Spirit guides us, and I believe that the, God wants to speak to us. And uh, yeah, and my, so my general advice would just be, be open to what God wants to speak to you. Um, and, um, you know, if you're, if you're an agnostic or you're an atheist, just because you're too lazy to actually uh, think about things, then I would go ahead and do that. Um, when it comes to atheism, uh, I think that's a pretty hard uh, 
yeah, position to take that, you know, if all the knowledge of the that's ever existed is my hand, like how much of that do we actually know? And then to say that what's not um, doesn't contain something that where we could believe that God exists. Uh, but just, yeah, approach spirituality with an open heart and open mind and, um, and, and think about what's beyond ourselves, you know, like uh, um, we have this tendency to fight or flight mm -hmm. and, um, and that's part of what science is. Um, but let's let's fight for the things that are important uh, and run away from the things that that are going to be destructive. And um, if you do that younger in your life, you're going to save yourself from a lot of destruction. Uh, follow if you're interested in something, fo follow someone who does it well, um, who who does it according to what is what is true according to that. Uh, you know, f for, you know, get a get a mentor, get someone to speak into your life. Uh, and when you're older, if you're older, speak in other people's lives. Uh, take the time to. Uh, love the person in front of you. I think the greatest existential threat um, to human beings is the lack of presence. Because if you're not present, um, then you're not going to be able to touch the person's life. If you're not present, you're not in a relationship. So be in relationship with those who are seeking what is good, noble, true, and loving.